of on the internet. Um, as far as uh, scribes go, I can probably scribe for today, unless someone else feel an urge to do that. Um, and as far as the next call, um, the next call is scheduled to two weeks from now. Uh, so um, July 25th. Um, I will not like both me and Ilya will be out of office in like in Montreal for the ITF. Um, so I think it's like from my perspective, it would be best to postpone it to a week after that, if that works for everyone. Um, so that would make it, um, let me actually pull up a calendar and the week after that would be August 1st. Would that work for folks or August 1st, a, um, so 11 a.m. PST. Any strong objections? Um, Okay. Uh, the twenty fifth won't work for me. Yeah, the twenty fifth. It would like. Yeah, there are a lot of collisions there. Uh, so August first, would that work? Sure. Okay. Going once, going twice. Um. Okay. So let's go with um, August 1st um, as for the next meeting. Uh, August 1st, 11 a.m. PST. OK, and with that, we can get to the agenda. Um, so Philippe, uh, the first item on the agenda is you showing off your New and shiny dashboard. Um, is that okay by you? Um, Philippe. He just typed in a link, so. Yeah. I, Here we go. Now you should be able to hear me. Okay, awesome. All right. Okay. Sorry. Yes, I was looking for the mute uh, unmute button. Yes, I typed in the link. So, um, so um, if you open that page, um, um, it will load. Um, um, it's still work in progress, but it will load. It's just a sample. Um, the idea after that is, is that page will go into our, our GitHub repository, and uh, and expose to the WC website using the normal means that we already have. So uh, basically. Um, uh, uh, it happened that we have a lot of data flying around uh, 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 regarding web technologies. We have data regarding specifications. We have data regarding tests. We have data regarding repositories, GitHub repositories. And, uh, and if you know where to look, you can find this data is actually public in some form or another, but you have to know where to look. And so first and foremost, Gargantua is basically accessing those data sources and exposing them to, to the world uh, uh, in a more meaningful fashion. So if you, this page is basically saying, well, show me the data that, uh, part of the data that you have related to the web plan performance working group. Um, I showed a, an earlier version of this page to, the, to you have Ilya and Todd during the face-to-face -face meeting, and I started to implement some of their feedback into it. Uh, um, and so, so um, uh, uh, there is, uh, we have uh, at least two needs, potentially three. One is, well, um, we need a public pledge page for the rest of the world to see what we're working on. It's not really for us, it's for the rest of the world. And that's what this page is really, really about. Uh, it's for the rest of the world. Then we need a page that basically goes and, and, uh, and make it useful for us, where we need more data 
uh, in terms of uh, um, GitHub issues and so on. And we need potentially a page for the chairs themselves who also are interested in uh, more finer grain data uh, as well. And the bottom line, bottom line is for you all to basically realize what's happening in the working group without having to wonder where it's happening. Um, so, so, um, uh, so, as I said, this page only shows a Sorry, subset you, of information. Can you put the link on the doc? Oh, yes, sure. Uh, sorry. Should have done that. I added it to the minutes, but yeah, uh, I, I can copy it to the doc. Uh, OK, thank you. You have. Um, so uh, I'm going to, I'm about to put another, uh, an, another link, by the way. So, um, if you're wondering about, so what exactly are we looking at and what the data is underneath? Uh, well, I'm going to put it directly into the docs. So that will be fast. Uh, that will be easier like that. Um, one is, uh, oh, I need to make it a link. One is an example of uh, the underlying, uh, thank you, uh, uh, of the underlying data is, um, you can actually browse the, browse the data which is underneath. And it will show you everything that it knows. In this case, I did a query to say, oh, show me all of the active specification inside the working group. And then you can dive into those specification one by one. Um, to see all of the data we can show. Uh, you'll notice that there is a link to WPT as well, um, which is which is uh, somehow tenuous at the moment. Uh, it's relying on the data coming from Philip Jankenstein, actually. We don't have a clear way today to identify a specification with a given WPT directory. Um, so it's still ad hoc and uh, Philip Jankenstein have a tool who did that ad hoc link, but um, I talked to Marcos uh, last week, and it would be nice if we can have both in Bakshed and Respect a way to say, this is a WPT directory for this specification. Therefore, making the link between the two uh, clear, <clears throat> rather than relying on some uh, uh, dark magic uh, uh, for that. Um, uh um so so um uh, uh uh it's possible to show the result of wpt for each specs using icons the problem is like if i do that i'm going to enable a dos attack against this poor wpt server who is serving those icons uh, which is why I did not do that on the public page. Or uh, if I would have done that for today, you would have all conducted, happily conducted a DOS attack on that poor server. Um, mainly because for every single, every time you request an icon to show, let's say the test result for high resolution time on Chrome, it downloads all of the JSON file and filter it to just what you need. So if you request an icon for Chrome, an icon for, for, for Firefox, an icon for Safari, and you do that for the 12 or 15 specification we have in this working group, then you uh, realize that it's downloading the same file on the server side, you know, 70 times. And then if we all load that same page at the same time, you can imagine the server going down pretty fast. So, so um, uh, we will have to, there is a hackathon meeting being organized the day before TPAC, actually, where, where uh, um, one of my plan is to uh, encourage um, uh, the different parts of this puzzle to to uh, uh, optimize um, uh, optimize this. Uh, consequently, um, so so um, for this purpose. Um, I think the, the main point is, is that um, I feel free to play, by the way, with, a, with, a, with the data. Uh, um, if you need to, um, if you need to, uh, 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 if you want to play with it and you, there is an API key listed in the HTML. Um, 
uh, uh, you can request your own using the using your if you go access your WC account profile, you will see that one of the entries is well create API keys. So you can create your own API keys if you want to, um, and uh, and copy the HTML. There is nothing really secret about it. Um, the the API is read only anyway, so. So, and all of the data is already public, it's just that it's not exposed nicely with the API, but um, nothing really secret. Um, anything else I should say? No, I think I should keep it here. So the goal is to keep iterating on it to make it more useful for you guys uh, um, as, as it is. Uh, if there is data that you would like to see, uh, let me know. But I'm going to keep iterating over this over the summer. I didn't have a lot of time to work on it since the face to face meeting, unfortunately. But uh, I will, I do plan to keep iterating. Okay. Um, Any questions from anyone on the call about this? Is, is there a way to see issues in the tool? Um, um, yes, but only with a 24 hours delay. Um, well, uh, I understand basically what we talked about was the idea of showing something like issue counts with direct links to the GitHub issue list, <laughs> something along those lines, as a way to enable the tool to show is there something that needs to be done? And then link directly to the issues was kind of how we had brainstormed it at the face-to-face. -face. Um, rather than, let's say, querying and displaying all of the issue content. Is that how you remember our conversation, Philippe? Um, uh, yes. Um, but as I said, so so as I said, actually, I can paste the link to if you want to know where the issues are in that data set, they're over here. Um, uh, uh, that's right now. The problem is that those issues are twenty. They're only. I'm not accessing the GitHub API. The problem with the GitHub API it's limited. Its its write limit is is uh, is extremely low. And uh, and uh, uh, we so it's using it. We are crawling our repository every night to gather this information. But consequently, the data could be 24 at most 24 hours behind when you're looking at it. And we're looking at how's the way to make this data more real time as much as possible, so that when a working group would have a phone call, they would actually see reality that's potentially something which is a few hours behind. Um, that might be possible uh, by enabling uh, one the, the working group to schedule the time at which that query happens to just be an hour before the phone call or something very simple. Well, my hope is that it will only be one minute behind reality. Okay. So um, that's that's our goal. We have the data. We have a server which is gathering all of this data through events. But we haven't optimized this server to actually deliver this data efficiently yet. But we're looking into it. And is it possible to have that kind of a, like, basically have this data be generated on the server or have the pages be generated on the server? Yes. Uh, and then deliver the result rather than you know the data itself? Uh, yes, it is possible. Um, uh, to do that, I, and I talk to our system folks to to do that as well. So, so however, it may probably won't happen before TPAC. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> so, my perspective is this looks really, really good as a tool and as a way to to present what the group is working on. Um, my only question is, how fast can we get it? <laughs> Up and, uh, and pen running. So I'll keep iterating. Um, um, I mean, it's the code is on GitHub. So by the way, there is, um, let me put a link to the GitHub repo for it. Uh, it work on? The Gargantua one, yes. Yeah. So, so um, 
so that's why it's kind of like if you are will, if you want to fork it, I mean, like go ahead. I have no problem at all. Um, uh, with it, hold on. Let me put that into the agenda. Boop, 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 boop. Lost the proper tab. Here we go. This is where the uh, GitHub repository is at, and you can either contribute or fork it. It contains more craft. I basically had to create my own framework. Uh, yes, you heard me right. Uh, create my own framework in order to make it work because um, the tool is using, uh, for performance reason, the tool is the tool is doing lazy evaluation, meaning unless you ask for the data for some specific data, it's not going to try to load the data itself. Uh, uh, because if you try to load everything, you may crash your browser, by the way. Um, and so uh, this is the client, the client view of what is actually uh, displayed based on the data? Uh, yes. But if you open your dev tool, you will see that uh, Especially when you use the browse.html tool that I provided as well, you will see that it's doing, you know, as you are unfolding things, it may create more fetches in the background because you're suddenly accessing specific information that was not preloaded consequently. Which is why also it would be easier. It's kind of like if we just generate that on the server side, then, uh, then we don't have to deal with all of this craft. Cool. Um, any more questions? Okay. Um, so I guess in terms of like we had bullet points for demo and next steps, I guess the next step is for everyone to show up at the hackathon before TPAC and <laughs> make it this thing awesome. Well, the Akadan is a more general scope because it's where also, I mean, respect will be there, Philip Jankenstein will be there, and so on. It's just a way to, for all of those people who are creating tools around it to synchronize because the, we have a greater need lately to link all of those information. So we're hoping to have some of the MDN people as well there and so on. So, so with the goal of like, we can know, we can, the more we know, the better we all are. Okay. Sounds good. Um, okay. Uh, so, shall we move on to the next uh, topic of the day? Um, Andrew, uh, do you want to talk about upload compression? Sure. Yeah. Let's get the presentation set up. OK. All right, so this is an idea that we've informally floated in prior discussions, particularly involving profiling. Um, so if you recall, way back when, when we were talking about um, the size trade-off for traces, uh, we talked about adding a gzip format, potentially. And I think a few people suggested that it might make more sense to break out any kind of compression into its own API for reuse, particularly because uh, Facebook has also seen wins from using compression on the client side in other places as well. So this is just like a informal, like sort of discussion provoking explainer about how we might, or if we want to tackle this domain at all. <coughs> so yeah, um, as I said before, it's basically all your favorite IETF standards in the browser, uh, many of which are already shipped, of course. Um, with reference implementations for things like image decoding for cases like JPEG, or for like general purpose compression algorithms like GZIP and Brotley. Um, for the most part, the plumbing's already there in most user agents. The main use cases for this um, are either like complex native like apps that might want to interface with like um, a file format that leverages gzip compression or perform file uploads on data that might necessarily have a lot of redundancy in it or might not otherwise be compressed, as well as actually sending run payloads. So like JSL profiling included here. 
Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, we've seen quite large um, delivery reliability improvements from using compression on the client side prior to sending XHRs, uh, especially in users with really spotty network conditions where it makes a lot more sense to spend a little bit more time on the client to prepare a smaller payload over like say a 3G network or worse. Now, we have this great general purpose programming language in browsers, like why don't we use them? Um, the big problem we ran into when leveraging WASM for compression was performance. Um, were you to ship a implementation of Snappy um, naively with like the standard compression algorithm, uh, in Rust with the necessary like standard libraries and allocators, that's going to be around one to two megabytes compressed of WASM binary. And that's uh, quite significant to ship to every single user for um, what's effectively like a well standardized algorithm. Like Snappy is just one example. Like we could also use gzip um, just by changing the compression level. It's mainly just for performance reasons. Um, also, it requires uh, routing your code such that you can interface with the WASM address space effectively. So you would need to do, you need to get your data inside the WASM address space to begin with. And if your existing code isn't wired up to do that effectively, then you're effectively doing a bunch of extra copies. Also, as I said prior, uh, these are well-defined standards. Um, UAs already ship a lot of these. Um, it would make sense to leverage them here rather than shipping the same algorithm on like tons of different pages for what's effectively already there. So in general, when we thought about like what we would want out of a compression API, we got these bullet points. Um, we really want it to be asynchronous um, so that we can defer this off the main thread and avoid horrible, horrible long tasks. And we also wanted a uniform interface so that this was potentially extensible and not tied to, say, gzip or like uh, Z standard. Additionally, um, it would be interesting to see if we could extrapolate higher level parameters from compression algorithms so that we could say like, oh, like on a like low end CPU, we might want to uh, actually use a lower compression level so that we use less cycles and we're okay with losing that extra degree of compression. And also, referring back to the WASM case, um, it would be nice to avoid extra allocations, especially on memory constrained devices. Anyone have any questions here? Or? Um, so you mentioned throttling back on low CPU devices and things of that sort. Is that something you envision in the control of the developer or in the control of the browser? Um, I think in control, the developer makes a lot more sense. Um, it would be kind of jarring to get different size payloads on the same um, uh, like inputs, depending on your device. Uh, in general, like um, there's already third-party libraries that can help you establish like what tier your device is that can help you make that decision. Okay. Right. Hey, is there going to be a way to query the compression algorithms that are available? Yeah. Um, so I didn't include that in this slide, but um, in general, like I think that like a sort of like uh, get like compressor types on this like compressor interface makes a lot of sense. Um, here's the API, by the way, or the pro proposed one. Um, there's an entry point through both streams and just a simple like uh, array buffer based interface. Um, you might notice that uh, to avoid extra allocations, the array buffer input actually transfers into like outside of the like uh, scripts control, so that you could conceivably reuse the same input allocation, which is like pretty much possible for all compression algorithms except on very small payloads. Um, are you aware that there were discussions in the past in the uh, Web Incubator community group about this? Uh, no, I'm not familiar. Um, All right, I'll put a pointer into the agenda so for you to look at it. There is this guy called You Have who made some comments a few years ago already about this. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Been on my to-do list for a while, but never made it all the way to the top. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, and the other thing is, uh, have you thought about boiling the ocean and potentially using this for video compression? Uh, so the, this is suitably general purpose. Um, the big question is, um, do you mean video compression of like client WebRTC streams or like- Yes, for example. Okay, I'm not too familiar with WebRTC, but if there's a place where you can just like input a frame, then this could easily be leveraged, especially if it's a streams-based API. I think the real dependency here is that it will require various APIs that do not maybe currently support streams to add stream support. So storage, IndexedDB, all of these places that may or may not currently have native stream support may need them. Is that fair, Andrew? Um, yeah, so if you want to use the streams entry point, you can. There's also the array buffer based one as well, um, which can interface with um, like older APIs that might just be able to take in like a, um, a copy into a managed array buffer. Um, it's also possible that we could add like a DOM string uh, entry point to this as well that returns an array buffer. Uh, I don't see too many options for values to return here other than either a like byte stream or an array buffer. Right. I, I guess I'm really thinking through the how do we avoid having websites making these bloated memory copies and by sticking to streams, they have to do extra work to copy memory, which is advantageous. Meaning if the implementation yeah. is built to conserve memory, you help you help them do the right thing. Right, right. And that was also sort of the motivation behind making the array buffer input transferable as well, that you wouldn't be able to keep that like input allocation around after. And you would just get like a new array buffer from the UA so that you would have to very deliberately copy the array buffer before providing it in. I like that conceptually, but I am concerned it would cause a lot of foot bends in the real world. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm Even happy with I like it as a perf person. Like, <laughs> how can we do that? And and yet, you know. Yeah, conceivably, we could make this a lot more explicit by naming that like transfer buffer in or something similar to that. So it's like, do not use or your array buffer will be fired. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, thanks for the input. Um, any comments on this sort of high level surface or? So I think if the primary use case of pull, um, sending back the server, why isn't this just an option in a fetch? Um, it's mostly just to make this more general. Um, there's cases where you might want to commit a lot of stuff to, say, like even local storage, where um, you want to like compress it beforehand and store it uh, to avoid like using a bunch of disk space. Um, also, yeah, that's a Good point regarding fetch. It was mostly just to make it as general purpose as possible, and especially because streams makes it so easy to compose various types of uh, inputs and outputs, fetch being one of them. I mean, the drawback of this approach is that now, like, everything, everything is, like, single-threaded, right? Like, now, it doesn't matter how compression's done. Like, you have to go back to main thread. Uh, not necessarily. Um, well, yes, you would need a sync point on the main thread to spawn it off. That is true. Um, yeah, was it, if this yeah. was an option in fetch, in a browser can do whatever in a whatever thread. Uh, yeah. Why does it have to be on the main thread? I think Ryusuke is referring to the case where you do a fetch, it returns, it yields a response, and then, sorry, you want, actually, I was thinking of res the response case. For the like request case, you would, like, um, well, but the thing is, in a request case, you have to right. You would want to uh, you would make, um, requ Any... request to compress, and then once that returns, you would do the fetch. Um, however, the streams should be sufficient for that. If you create a new readable stream tracking your input, and then you f do a fetch request with the body equal to the readable stream returned, then you wouldn't need any main thread intervention. Oh, I see. You're saying in, in your example, you're awaiting. But you don't need it, is what you say. Right. So the uh, example that Risk is referring to is only for the array buffer based case where you do need to await. 
the streams based API, you would not. So yeah, uh, that's a good point, especially from a semantic um, viewpoint of actually including it in fetch. Um, but for the most part, I think the streams does accomplish that suitably well, or at least avoids the case that you're talking about. Yeah, I still think it better to do that on fetch, because I mean, it's just more efficient not having any sort of JavaScript API for this, right? So, so we have several use cases where this is important on the client side, for example, for local storage related, or storage in general related quotas. If you're storing things on the client, you want to make sure they are compressed there rather than just on the wire. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just off the top of my head. I'm not sure if there weren't other uh, use cases which favored decoupling it from, from fetch. And also, it's not clear that you always want to treat the payload with a single algorithm, for example. Like, you could choose to compress the text. Like, you know, if you're sending a payload that has mixed image data and text data, you want to compress the text in one way or some of the text with broadly, well, some with gzip, and some of it with well, so yeah, the so since you're pointing out the next point i was going to point out so the problem is like so that do that and then like the presumably this proposal here is the fetch world oh my god a headers to set the encodings and stuff like that right because i mean clearly server needs to know what kind of compression we're using so like yes. <laughs> there's no sort of header uh, enforced for this since this is very network agnostic um, you would have to interpret it through whatever scheme you'd want on the server side. So you're saying that if you're using a fetch, you have to manually specify headers to specify the encode? So it depends on what you're doing with the fetch. Like presumably, um, like if you want to like actually accept this, you'd have you'd either always expect this, or you could add a header manually as you suggest. Um, it doesn't seem far fetched to me that you would always want to like assume compressed data. If this were to be used, Ooh, that kind of assumes that you're writing your servers and manually, right? Like if you're using any sort of like standard, like server, like you would have to manually deal with that situation. Sure, but no standard server right now decompresses uh, the payload. Like if, even if you have, uh, you know transfer encoding or content encoding on the upload right now, I don't think there are a ton of uh, standard HTTP servers that would support that. So I think you can convince Apache 2, but it's not that. by default. What? Oh, sorry, I think you can convince Apache 2, but it's not by default. Sure, so you need some sort of negotiation uh, between the client and the server to see if the server supports it. And then, uh, like, it's, which is, Potentially useful, but I think that most of the use cases here can be just addressed if you like because you are handling the payload eventually. Uh, so you you are collecting that data on the servers. So you collect it compressed, and you know, you know the method in which you compressed it. So you can figure that out on the yeah. server. Yeah, I would just like to add my support for something like this. We we do a lot of uh, jumping through hoops and ship a lot of code and use a lot of CPU in Boomerang to try to compress resource timing data and user timing data, just like Andrew was suggesting for J JavaScript profiles. Um, so having some way of getting the browser to do that in a cheaper, more efficient way, ideally, would, would be ideal. Um, you know whether it's uh, the stream-based approach or an option on the fetch would be useful for us as well. But either way, um, it'd be nice to not have to be doing this in JavaScript. The 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 other compression that we're doing in JavaScript. And I do think what Riosake states has some value because if the browser supports default compression through APIs, the servers will will quickly add default support for the decompression on the server. So, you know, it's a chicken and egg problem here where today it's hard, so servers don't support it. Uh, I was just referencing Web API to see what you have to do. And yeah, you have to toggle off a bit to make it support it. But why? Like, it could easily be default. Yeah. 
So yeah, I think there's um, value in exploring that as a separate topic. Primarily, if both this client side implement or this um, like script invoked implementation leverages the same set of defined algorithms and compression options as a fetch based algorithm or a fetch based design. But there are definitely, definitely, I think there is a case to be made that we would want both, not just the fetch, as you have pointed out. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's useful to have the ability to compress data separate from the need to store. Uh, I guess the other question is, I wonder if it's useful to have the some type of string that is unique for the settings you're passing into this to create this compressor that is clearly standardized and reusable. Yes. Meaning, uh, a thing that can be passed along with these bytes feels like an important piece of this. Um, so would that be a string that tells the server how it was compressed? It could be that, or it could be a thing that goes with the data on disk, or a thing. Okay. I, I don't know where the data is going. I'm just okay. Yeah. Out that in fetch, it's probably to tell the server, but in putting it, I don't know. I'm just imagining scenarios now. But you know, if you're sending it through something else, then you know, if it isn't going to be, let's say, the version of your client upgrades three versions, and your default. Uh, write and read protocol is different, and you read old data. So that's an example where you might need the old decompressor version to get that data out of local storage. Yes. Yeah, so provide. Um, oh, I see. You're referring to long live artifacts. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so just have data that whatever the de decompressor is, it will have that data to know how to decompress. That seems useful. Yeah. Yeah. It seems useful, and I'm just making up. I'm just thinking through problems <laughs> that might happen mm -hmm. when people try to use this API. Mm -hmm. um, no, that's good. Definitely, though, the idea is good. It's probably an old idea. In fact, I just saw Eric popped on here. <laughs> hey, Eric. Hello. So uh, Andrew is presenting uh, the idea of uh, a compression web compression API. Cool. Yeah. Client side make data smaller, textual okay. or arbitrary? Super arbitrary for maximal fun. Nice. <laughs> okay, cool. Um yeah, no, that sounds good. Um I'll definitely um dig more into that, see if um that makes sense, the like binary based header approach. Um yeah, for the most part, like I is there are there many use cases where one would like vary the compression format itself um, on, <clears throat> on the same value? Um, so for from my perspective, you could have a mix of data where some of it is known ahead of time, where you have a lot of process. <clears throat> you can invest a lot of processing power, and you know, broadly eleven it where. Other is something you want to compress more or less on the fly. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if this is something you have to tackle in a single stream or if those streams can be combined afterwards somehow. Yeah. I think if it's made suitably general, the definition <clears throat> of like the compression algorithms available and like how they would work, then parallel. And then other potential interfaces could leverage that. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for the feedback. I mean, another thing to consider is whether um, certain compression is more efficient than certain hardware wires. Sorry, I didn't catch that last part. Well, some compression might be more efficient than others in a certain yeah. hardware wires, right? So, I yeah. mean, it, just because things might be optimized differently on a given browser or operating system. So right now, like, I mean, if the author is just always picking the same type, that may or may not be fast or you know power efficient or whatever. For sure. For so sure. Like you might you might need something like um the what media does about like giving some sort of preferred algorithms or like a way to pick based on the compression efficiency or like power efficiency and stuff like that. Perhaps. Yeah. No, that sounds good. Um 
I mentioned that in the discussion slide that it would it might be worth investigating whether or not we want to provide abstraction for things like that across algorithms or to effectively have each like implementation take take its own like bag of bag of flags, so to speak. Yeah. I I think that a bag of flags would be a more like a better option because there are more things involved than just compression level. Mm -hmm. like, with just gzip you have multiple options that you know for example like again one of the use cases was implementing ssh in the browser and if you want to do that there are like ssh depends on very specific gzip flags um like uh, something related to the flushing like the Flush buffers, I don't remember if it requires immediate flushing or requires accumulation, but it's like it's very requires something very specific there. And you want to enable that. So you probably want to, yeah, a, a bag of flags yeah. is probably the better option. One more point uh, is related to um, um, compression dictionaries. Mm -hmm. That's also something that um, I know that the Broccoli folks did a lot of work on. I know that for GZIP, you would probably like, if you're compressing resource timing data, you can probably have some sort of a, you know, send down a dictionary that will significantly reduce the amount of data that you're sending up. So there's some trade up there, but you, yeah. you know. Uh, no, <clears throat> external dictionaries was definitely, um... Definitely one of the goals. Um, I think that my original suspicion was that that would be tackled sufficiently by bag of flags. Okay. Um, the idea of how we would persist those dictionaries um, beyond just letting the client figure out how to uh, is still open. Um, yeah. I. Like what I had in mind was like user land dictionaries and some sort of coordination between the client and the server, but yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, that sounds good. Um, is there anything beyond bag of flags that you would want for that use case? Um, I'm not sure, not sure, but yeah. Um, it could tackle it, but it will become a large bag. Yeah, <laughs> that is true. Yeah. OK, cool. Um, I'll do some more research on that in the future. Um, any more questions? Yeah, uh, one, Go ahead. I was going to say one other point to make for the RUM analytics use case. Um, presumably, this is going to be an asynchronous task where you're compressing this data. But in RUM analytics, frequently you're sending data back to a server as the page is unloading in like a visibility change handler or something like that. Mm -hmm. So adding an option to fetch could be beneficial in not having to do that work in an asynchronous way, which would prove most likely fail if you're sending it in an unload handler or a visibility change handler. Um, but if it were an option on fetch, then you could let the browser do it kind of separately from unloading the page and delaying the start of the next page load. Okay. Yeah, no, I think um, fetch integration is definitely worth looking into. And um, I'll see if I can uh, integrate this well together. Yeah, cool. and from my perspective, it's really like a, there's a real like extensible web kind of play here where you provide like providing the primitives and then integrating them into fetch as a high level API that enables you to take use of them in mm -hmm. a specific scenario. Yeah, that sounds good. Cool. Going once. <laughs> hey, I was just going to say really quickly about the compression level thing. Like, um, I for us, like, use case would be LZ4, GZIP, BZIP2 as variants on compression algos. So mm -hmm. that matters more to us than um, some kind of abstract compression level thing. So okay. I think yeah, so just like being able to pick the algo and do the, you know, the big bag of options that that's totally sufficient meets our case. Perfect. Sounds like there's a good argument for the bag of flags then. Sweet. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.
Um, and moving on to the next item in hand with, oh, with 10 minutes to go. Uh, Nicholas. Um, yes. Um, so I want to talk about element timing text aggregation. Um, I linked a WICG explainer there. We also have a draft spec. Um, but in this uh, meeting, I want to focus on the decision we made regarding how to aggregate text notes to containing elements. Uh, but feel free to look at the WICG explainer or spec and file feedback on GitHub. Um, so we considered several approaches and we went with aggregating a text node to the nearest containing block ancestor. Um, the reason we did this is uh, first. Uh, Can we just state what the high level problem is that we're trying to solve? Oh, sure. Sorry. So, sorry, as a recap, the high level problem we're trying to solve is element timing wants to expose important text content. Um, and by important, we mean uh, annotated by web developers. Uh, so in particular, we need a way for web developers to say, this is text that I care about. So presumably, something like saying, putting an element timing attribute on your P, uh, like the paragraph element, or in your header element, should enable you to get timing information about the text that is contained in that element. Uh, as text notes themselves are not elements, um, we need a way to specify which text notes belong to which elements for the purposes of element timing. Does that explain that? Okay. So we chose to say that a text node belongs to its closest containing block ancestor. Uh, the containing block is already defined in CSS and it intuitively matches what we want visually, which is to have blocks of text notes that are like one cohesive self uh, to be grouped into the same element while at the same time having enough granularity um, so that text, text that is very different or very far apart in the page from other groups of text are not aggregated together. Um, and it can also be implemented efficiently. Um, so some of the alternatives that we considered uh, first was a notion of depth. Uh, this was too arbitrary. For example, adding a hyperlink should not change whether the text in the link belongs to the paragraph or not. Uh, but it does increase the depth of the text node because it will now be contained in an additional element before the paragraph. So we considered that to be too arbitrary. Uh, we also consider defining a notion of top level elements, but I think that would require a lot of work and not just now, but also in the future when new types of elements are defined, it would require evaluating whether those should also be top level elements or not. So having a new notion in element timing seems to be not very future proof. Um, we also considered using phrasing content. Uh, this one will work similar to the block level elements. Uh, and we decided to go with the containing block because it is simpler to implement. Since uh, we already have to traverse the blocks in a specific order during the paint traversal. So I just want to show some examples that show some improvement on considering 
the text nodes by themselves versus the text nodes in aggregate. The red there is the text nodes by themselves, and the dark red or brown, whatever that color is, is the rect containing, rect for the element that contains potentially multiple text nodes. So going from left to right, the first example shows that before the title was um, listed as two separate rects, and now it's a single rect, which I think makes sense in that case. In the middle example, the main improvement there is that the top right paragraph is now considered a cohesive element of text. Um, the third example has, I think, no change, which seems fine because it's a bunch of pretty much separate titles. So I think it's uh, reasonable to have them be separate. Then we have another example where the bottom is very improved. As you can see, before it was a lot of small red rectangles, it is transformed into more cohesive groups of paragraphs. And then here, yeah, and you can see that it's because of the styling or the linking being used. Uh, the aggregation approach takes care of that. Um, the next example is pretty much similar. Uh, there is slight improvement in the first paragraph. Uh, notice that it has some bolded text, but not all. And that means that the text notes will be split for the bold text. So we need to aggregate them to be in the same paragraph as the surrounding text. And the last example is also similar where we have a paragraph with some hyperlinks and the text with those special styles are now in the same paragraph as the other text from that paragraph. Sorry, in the same block, containing block. Um, so I don't know if there's any feedback about this or questions. And just to confirm the concept. Um, I'm a, so. Oh, sorry, Will. Uh, I was just going to, um, oh, <laughs> didn't mean to kick him off the meeting. <laughs> uh, hopefully he's back in just a sec. Um, the concepts that both of these alternatives are based on are both standardized concepts, correct? Talking about phrasing content versus the containing block level element? Yes. Both of them are standardized, yes. OK. Uh, yep. Phrasing content is. I think that developers are much more familiar with the notion of block level elements than they are the notion of phrasing content as well, which right. I think is another benefit. Right. Yeah, that's another benefit, because as a developer, you kind of need to know what text is being aggregated where, so that uh -huh. you can specify, annotate the important element that you care about. OK. So this is two web developers that will also be more familiar to how they think about the layout of their pages. The second reason it's beneficial. Yep. Right. Sorry, Will, are you back? <laughs> I am. Sorry about that. I was I was trying to mute my microphone and uh, to let you talk, and then I hit the exit button. Anyway, long story. Um, just a quick question about this. If a developer, let's say, does want to learn something about a very specific part of the text, um, are they able to, could you just, as a developer, wrap it in a in an element so that you could just do the timing on that one thing to force disaggregation? Is that the idea? Uh, that is kind of not the idea. Um, because if you wrap it in a block level element, the layout 
of the page will change? I'm trying to remember. So uh, that's a great question. We should probably think about it more. I'm trying to figure out inline block. Does inline block create a... Yeah, but it also changes block? the layout of the element, which is inline blocked. We should think about that. That's a good question. I believe I, I believe the yeah, if you if you were to wrap it in a in a block element, if it was not already wrapped in one, uh, that might change the way it is displayed. Uh, I'm not sure, sure if there's something to do it. Right, you have to, right, you'd have to work around that, but I'm just trying to give I'm trying to think about an option there for a developer who, you know, unfortunately would have a bunch of these tiny elements or mm -hmm. tiny text uh, 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 sections aggregated up into one forcefully and automatically, but may not want that because they want to just know about one specific one. So if there's a workaround for them, I didn't know if that was, a, if that just the manually wrapping it was an option. Right. What? Uh, we're wrapping it in a span and then have the element timing attribute on that specific span work? Or our current proposal that's sort of is something that's sort of something I was suggesting or something like that. In our current proposal, that would not work. Uh, everything would aggregate up to the nearest containing block. Um, we, there's an issue where you we don't want to report a single element us or a single text node twice um, because that seems kind of confusing and so then if you annotate both that span and you annotate the parent element we could potentially be reporting that multiple times maybe that's correct but that's why we were shying away from that um, I think we, we either need to uh, figure out a way that you can insert a containing block uh, if that's possible, which would be one solution. We need to allow double reporting for a single element, um, which would be the the only other solution I can think of. Um, well, the, from, well, I don't know, but I would think that mostly the problem is the other way around, uh, also even in the screenshots. Um, generally, text notes are very small. Um, so I would think that in most cases, developers want to aggregate them. Uh, so I'm not sure how big of a problem this is in general. Uh, it's worth putting some thought into yeah, it, at least. worth looking into it. I think we're over time here. Uh, yes, we are. Um, so yeah. I guess if there are any other questions, uh, folks can pick, like open an issue on the element timing repo. Um, and yeah, I, we, I will see you all uh, three weeks from now on 